Welcome back, everybody, to Uncensored CMO. Now, did somebody say it's time to get the global VP for brand onto the podcast? Yes, they did. I'm joined in this episode by none other than Suzo O'Brien, who is the brains behind the very famous Just Eat campaign that I know you've all heard of because it's impossible to get out of your head, to be quite frank. Um, this is a wonderful episode. I catch up with Suzo to find out a little bit more about how they come up with the campaign and how it's driven the success of the business and how they've kept that challenger mindset going despite being the global leaders. This is a great conversation. There's so much in it. You're going to love it. Here it is. Suzo O'Brien. Welcome to the show. Thanks, John. Uh, it's great to be here today. Now, I, I need to, well, I don't know if I should thank you or apologise on behalf of everybody that's now got, did somebody say, kind of going through their heads now. Like, it's one of those things, isn't it, that just sticks in your mind. Yeah, I mean, obviously, that was um, always the game plan uh, to become that kind of earworm so that we could always be top of mind and the brand be front and centre when people are thinking about getting food or groceries delivered. So yeah. I think you've succeeded. But before we get there, because I'm obviously dying to talk to you about the campaign, how you sure. came up with it and how it's delivered for uh, for you as a brand. But let's start at the beginning. How did you get into marketing? And why marketing in the first place? I did a postgraduate at Kingston Business School in marketing specifically. Um, came out of college and wanted to do something vocational. And Kingston at the time was a great place to do that with great connections to industry. Uh, so felt like I might get a job at the end of it. Wow. So that's where it all started. So hang, hang on, hang on. Still, still there goes a marketer trained in marketing. This is this is unique, right? It sets you apart. Ah, oh, that's very kind. But um, it was a great training ground, actually. And what was great about the course in particular was that all the lecturers were grounded. They'd all come from industry. So they weren't kind of the traditional theoretical professors. They'd been there, got the T-shirt. So they were able to, I suppose, yeah, they were able to teach you stuff, you know, from from the real world. And I just want to share one memory I had. We'd all planned to go out to the pub one night. It's like, yeah, great. After lectures, we'll go. And it it was about five o'clock and we're all planning which boozer we were going to go to. And the lecturer, uh, Lindsay Firth McGuckin, um, who was amazing, um, Lindsay said, right, assignment tonight, it's due in tomorrow morning, nine o'clock. And we all went, you've got to be kidding me. And she went, welcome to the real world. This is what oh, happens. Oh, that's a lesson. And that's true, isn't it? If, if you ever pitch for business, if you've ever been preparing a customer presentation for the next day. I've had many a, many a 9 a.m. Tesco yeah. annual negotiation. Yeah, yeah, that's very true, isn't it? I, want, I think the worst one I had, actually, I went to um, I went to a networking event. Uh, in fact, I was talking about pitching with agencies, and I, I was the token client who was kind of, you know, representing all of client land. And um, uh, they, were, they were having a go at me about, yeah, we don't, you know, we never get enough notice. And, uh, and this is about 9 p.m. at night, so it's an evening thing, right? And I said, can I just mention something? Tomorrow morning, I'm getting up at 4 a.m. Yeah. I'm driving five hours to see Greg's the Baker because <laughs> Greg's the Baker are my biggest customer. Yeah. And I've got to go and defend our listing. Yeah. And I think people forget everyone has a customer and everyone's under pressure, you know, in, in terms of their customer. Yeah, I think that was that was a real lesson for me. And as you can tell, it is a while ago, but it really stuck with me. It's like, you know, this isn't about choosing what you want to do necessarily. You have to be responsive. And if there's a deadline, you need to meet it. So, yeah, it was all we were all at working all night and. I think alcohol might have been consumed <laughs> after the, the the hand in, but yeah, it was definitely not consumed. Quite right, that celebrate night. the yeah. completion. Absolutely. Um, in your career as well, you've spent quite a lot of time freelancing as well. Um, how, how was that? Because I, I've only I've only done six months of freelancing in my career, and I found it flipping scary. I mean, I didn't. I remember not knowing what business was going to come in and how much I was going to get paid in the next month. It was quite a. So why did you end up freelancing, and yeah. how did, how did it go? I think you know you're calling it freelancing. I I kind of maybe kind of package it slightly differently for me um, I branched out on my own and set up my own Suzo Limited consultancy and the reason why I did it was pure and simple I had a family and I wanted to spend a bit more time with them with with my babies who are no longer babies and this felt like a at the time it felt like a really good way to do it and great supportive husband so yeah it definitely was feast or famine but what it did it allowed me to travel the world I did a lot of strategy a lot of brand strat and lots of different categories, you know. And as I said, you know, I was in the Middle East, I was in uh, Malaysia, I was in Russia, I was in the Nordics and, and Europe. So probably didn't get to spend as much time with my children as I thought I had. But yeah, you know, one day it's full on deadlines uh, and the next it's like, oh my God, where's yeah. the next bit of work going to come from? Yeah. So scary, but I think, you know, it kind of teaches you that you um, just go with it. 
go with it, what will be will be. But certainly building networks, mm. talking to people and putting yourself out there a little bit as well. So, yeah, and sometimes that's hard. That's true. I mean, I only had limited experience. But what I, I, I remember learning from that time was, A, the power of the network and referrals and, and, and the reputation you build actually as a as a person. But also I got to work on some really cool stuff, but you get to see different industries tackling similar challenges. And it gives yeah. you such a breadth, doesn't it? And I think that's the point is kind of, you know, what, what's transferable in the skill set that you've got? You know, what is the problem that, that they're trying to solve and then kind of approach it with that? Well, for me anyway, it's through a marketing lens. But yeah, I mean, I learned so much and, you know, I mean, I remember once I was presenting in Kuwait to the um, Kuwaiti Federation for, of Science, and I'm like with these marine biologists, these like, and I felt so intimidated by these superstars. And they're like, yeah, but you know everything about marketing. We don't know anything yeah. about that. So, yeah, just kind of extremes, like, and I look back and just think how rich that was. And again, the important thing of kind of building those relationships, understanding, you know, again, what the problem is and what you're trying to solve for. Mm. I remember actually in my, li in my little uh, part of the career, I ended up pitching to a Formula One team and to a Premier League football team, stuff I'd never thought I'd do. You're right, you get in the room with some really interesting people and some really interesting challenges, which is uh, a lot to be said for it. But I, I never quite got used to the whole, I don't know how much I'm going to earn this month. That was a weird thing to yeah and, and, and again on that so again husband supporting me you know big champion but you you just I just had a flashback then when you talked about Premier League I, I recall again this is a long time ago and I'm showing my age but the the launch of Manchester United TV I worked at Sky and I remember being in the boardroom at Man United and Ryan Giggs was there Alex you know uh, Ferguson and I just thought what the hell am I doing here? You know, so some of the experiences I've had, some of the opportunities have been a bit crazy. But yeah, that was just a bit of a flashback. That We're going to come back to this because you've okay. worked with some pretty cool talents in your current role, haven't you? Which we'll, we'll, we'll come and talk about. Uh, That's in, one in way of describing second. it, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll get, exactly. Or we'll come and find out more about it. Um, you know, you've been CMO, Global VP of Brand uh, for Just Eat for quite a long time now. I think almost coming up to eight years. I've not been as successful in keeping my jobs. Uh, so <laughs> I, I think I famously got like fired twice in one year. So what I'd love to know is, you know, the, the CMO or the most senior marketing organisation is a very tough place to be as the most senior marketer. What's the secret to longevity and, you know, succeeding in a role over many years? Well, when I first joined Just Eat, it was a very different organisation. And I went in there as a consultant, in fact, uh, the then CMO, Barnaby Dorr, um, who's a very dear friend of mine. He said, oh, Susie, can you come and help me? Uh, don't say no. Come and help me. I need a bit of a rebrand. And it was all at the time about changing people's perceptions about what the Just Eat brand stood for. And I continued to do that, actually, all these years later in terms of what is our offering, you know, from QSRs to, you know, mom and pop shops to groceries and what have you that we are now entering into in terms of that new vertical. But back then I joined um, as a consultant and, and yeah, and then I ended up staying. But how have I survived? I think that what I tend to do is is kind of build again those relationships around the business and and kind of make sure that you treat people <laughs> with kindness mm. but also very importantly do what you say you're going to do so share the vision share the direction and then execute against it so yeah I suppose um, I'm passionate about forward forward thinking forward planning and just getting on and doing the job yeah. so Maybe that's helped me a little bit. So I'd say it's more than a safe pair of hands. It's like, if you want something done, go and talk to Suzo. She'll help you make that happen. Balancing the strategy and execution is a good point, isn't it? Because it, yeah. it, you, you can be a CMO that's very good at strategy or very good at execution, but we really have to balance both those things, um, not just coming up with the ideas, but making them happen and making them, you know, deliver. Yeah, talking the talk, but not kind mm. of, you know, rolling your sleeves up and making it happen and making it happen brilliantly. And I think often it's better to be kind of 80, 90% right and do something and do it, yeah. rather than yeah. procrastinate. Yeah. And sometimes like stepping over the precipice, you know, just getting on with it. Yeah. Um, and just hoping that, that all is going to come You're right good. about procrastination. I, I found that very hard, actually, because sometimes you need to wait for all the information to yeah. become available, don't yeah. you? Some some people like, you know, rush to a decision and look like they're decisive and making a big difference. You know, so sometimes you have to know, know when to wait, know when to act, and that can be quite tricky. I've got a theory to run by you. So, um, okay, we talk about the four Ps, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think there are different four Ps for CMO. I just want to run this past you see, if you, see if you agree. I think the four Ps of CMO are politics, persuasion, people, and POs. So 
Uh, I remember whenever I've been CMO, the one time people would be knocking on my door, texting me, hounding me is when they want the money signed off. I never got to have all the fun, you know, making well, ads. Well, I, th- I think it's money <laughs> and people, isn't it? It's yeah. like, I need more resource. Can you approve this yeah. job requisition? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm definitely the most popular person um, when, when that happens and people chasing me. But it, it's then when I walk around the, the department and I can see some of the work that's coming together and people are either trying to hide their laptops, or their screens. I go, show me, show me. Because yeah. this is the bit I love. I I'm, I'm just like that. I'm saying, so, uh, yeah. I remember it annoyed all the teams I ever worked with, sort of thing. And then, you know, when you talk about the work, you know, you talk about I and we and together and that kind of thing. And people go, yeah, but John, you, you know, you didn't do the work. And I'm like, <laughs> Do you know what I did too? I gave you the air cover. So my job was yeah. basically to go and talk to finance, yeah. go and talk to the noisy sales director who's like, that would never work. You know, all those people that have got an opinion and are trying to stop what you're doing happen. Sometimes it's about just clearing the path, isn't it, for other people? Yeah. And I think, making sure that the team know that you've got their back. So you're right, it's kind of sideways and upwards and there's quite a bit of upwards as well. Yes. Um, That in and of itself is a challenge. But yeah, I I do miss a little bit of rolling the sleeves up and kind of getting on and doing some of the, the great creative work. But that you're absolutely right. I mean, some of the people at Just Eat are incredibly talented super smart a lot smarter than me uh, and so yeah i just enable them to try and get get on with what they do brilliantly and then as you said yeah clear the path enable them to do that and know that they can knock on the door and kind of go it's going really well it's not going so well what are we going to do about it so yeah definite kind of yeah approachable suzo to get on with it but you're yeah. right the politics the persuasion <laughs> the constant socializing of ideas and going i feel like i'm repeating myself it's that's because you are you've got to repeat uh, yourself a lot more than you yeah. think don't you because yeah. you, you know because you're very familiar with it in your head of course everyone knows this and you realize yeah. you talk to you know different departments they go what, what are you talking about <laughs> but even within your own department yeah. it's like why am i having to say this again and that's not a criticism but often as you say it's in your head you've got it really clear mm. but you have to you know communicate educate inform all of that multiple times to multiple people and then it might drop mm. so yeah that that sometimes i forget that actually because yeah. that's like it's really clear to me but now another, another theory i got on the cmo front is when everything goes well it's a team effort, right? The moment something goes wrong, guess who's on the hook, right? Yeah. It, it can feel like that. I mean, we're, you know, I, I've been in a few situations like that, but it can feel often, doesn't it, that when things go wrong, everyone's looking to the CMO to go, right, what are we going to do? Well, I, I think often it, it's kind of marketing can fix everything and we know that that's not the case. And you know that, again, that's why you need to work cross-functionally on projects and what have you. But yeah, I don't want to say it's a violin moment, but it can be quite lonely, mm. um, you know, in terms of some of the things you're trying to juggle and some of the, the things that you are trying to not share because it's not going to be helpful to share, but is kind of bubbling and is in the top of, you know, forefront of your mind. Yeah. Um, that can be a bit, yeah, hard sometimes. I think it's a massively lonely job. I, 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 I mean, having experienced it myself, it's when you're the most senior marketer, you're no longer one of the team. Mm bonding over doing the work you're you're kind of like the person that approves or the person that's in the board meeting you, you're kind of othered a bit aren't you you're like okay you know you're the which grown is, up yeah now. which is why as i said you know i don't show that don't show susie that's not yeah. ready for her to see it's like oh please show me yeah, i want to be on, part of it I, what, I feel part of I the team I yeah know. absolutely it's, i think i think just on that bit though is um I, I, there, we are a great marketing team at Just Eat Takeaway. And so I, I do I do feel very much part of a team, to be honest. But yeah, I know that I've got other jobs to be done as well yeah. as within marketing and outside marketing. In fact, the job is even bigger outside it of is. marketing it to is. be done. Yeah, I remember uh, having a chat with someone saying, how much time do you spend on advertising? And I actually went through my diary and worked out I spend 5% that only 5% of my wow. time was actually on advertising. When you actually look at it, you know, there's people, there's strategy, there's yeah. planning, there's finance, there's coaching, there's HR, there's one, there's so much stuff, isn't there, involved in the job. And I guess people's perception of the CMO being this creative, genius individual that just gets to sort of, you know. Hang out in can. All, hang out in can, exactly. <laughs> Do you know, I never went to can as a client. Have you been to can, by the way? I, I, I went to, to can. Um, I, the first time I went to can was, it was an incredibly um, lonely experience. I went on my own. And I thought, oh, this is going to be really cool. But I hadn't organized myself and I was kind of in and out. And I thought, oh, gosh, that's not what I thought. Anyway, I went 
last year. And for those of you who are listening, who went to Cannes, you'll know that it was chaos with with planes. So my plane was cancelled and I thought I'm not meant to go. But I went and spent quite a lot of time with my marketing academy fellows. And it was fantastic. I uh, had a great time and actually want to encourage most of the team to go with me next year because well, the learning fun. was yeah. really amazing and the weather wasn't bad yeah, either. Yeah, I, I, ne- I never got to go as a client, actually. Which, I, but you've I, been I've, since, though? I've been every single year. Oh, OK. Like since I've been doing this job, right? Oh, okay. I've, I've been invited out there and you know in fact uh, last year i went as press because the podcast was counted as press so i got a press pass in oh, so you had your big pass on i know it. yeah. it's a different yeah. experience you got to get you got to go to press releases and all the backstage things it was it was a different experience it was really good no, did you go to the spotify it. event i didn't actually okay. no I, I i didn't either just no to- i I was Captain Sensible. So um, Kerry, who helps uh, manage the show, literally booked me up like onto every panel. Like I had seven podcasts to record. I wow. had about three panels to do yeah. other things as well. So I was I was that kind of overly sweaty guy running up and down the quasette kind of between things. So. But what I thought what was great about it as well is that everybody was there. You know, mm. it was kind of a, it was agency side, it was client side. There was a whole heap of people. It was like constantly bumping into people that, you know, I've known yeah. for years. And it's like, oh my God, you can, great, let's get together. But yeah, time ran away. Well, basically, but, I, I call it LinkedIn in real life. Yeah, great description. That's what it is, yeah. basically. And once yeah. you get past the fact that, you know, well, actually, when I went to the um, the Palais, very few people were looking at the work. Mm. It was almost empty. So where they dis- displayed all the work, everyone was out networking. So for me, it's just like one giant networking opportunity. Yeah, I never actually went to the Palais. As I said, I was kind well, of yeah, doing, yeah, yeah. yeah. I went because I mean, I, I was I was on a couple of panels as well myself, but you know, I I did go for that learning experience. But it was the connections; it was just Amazing. It was mad. That that yeah. is the reason to go yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Now we must get on to, of course, did somebody say, uh, <laughs> as he says, you I know, love the and, singing. Oh, I'll butcher it. I know exactly. <laughs> I'm sure everyone does. It must be a thing. You must go and have karaoke, and it, it all starts with that. Um, um, but take us back to the beginning of that. So, um, yeah. you know, where did the origin of that idea come from? What what need were you addressing? And Wow. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go back a little bit. So I was tasked with running an agency pitch uh, in Q4, maybe just the back end of Q3 of 2018. Ran the pitch uh, with some of the very best in the industry and ended up after some incredible pitch theatre like a bit of pitch theatre, from our fantastic colleagues, partners, friends at McCann London. Uh, McCann won the pitch and very unusually, we ran the pitch work. We launched, did somebody say? Yeah. That was in the pitch? That was in the pitch. That idea? That idea was in the pitch and it was simply brilliant. And yeah. Was your first reaction that? Yes. One of the things that's interesting about that phrase is it requires you to join the dots, doesn't it? And it's one of those ideas that I think gets better and better the more familiar you are with it. So did 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 you get it straight away when they pitched it? You went, oh, that's it. Or did you Well, did... what I loved is that, you know, did somebody say just eat? It wasn't just did somebody say, it was did okay, somebody say yeah, just eat. Yeah. So so it just felt really normal. It felt local. It felt it didn't feel forced. It felt like something that that could land in the vernacular. And so, yeah, it, that, I remember calling Alex Lubar at the time and, you know, when you're delivering the nice news that you've won the pitch, it's, there's nothing better, that feeling, actually. Of course, it's a, it's, it's a position of power. Mm. But I said to Alex at the time, I said, how are you feeling? He said, it depends what you say to me, Susan. <laughs> uh, bizarrely, yeah. again, another story. He was actually in the doctor's surgery. I said, oh, crikey. Uh, and he said, um, I told them that they'd won the pitch. And obviously he was over the moon and uh, was really clear that I wanted to make that announcement pre-Christmas, which we did. And then we launched the uh, first iteration. I think most people think the first iteration of Did Somebody Say um, Creative campaign was with Snoop. But in Mm. fact, it wasn't. It was in 2019. We launched it in the majority of what we call our Just Eat legacy markets in kind of Western Europe, um, as well as Australia. And um, we launched it with what became uh, quite an irritating earworm but again it was kind of that repetition and I know that that Mark Ritson has talked about you know a little bit of genius in that in terms of did somebody say did somebody say did somebody say did somebody say just eat Uh, and we ran that but what we then lent into is um, a piece of insight and a piece of customer feedback is you know it was a little bit marmite people loved it or hated it and it became the irritating earworm it's like oh if I hear that one more time and 
whilst that kind of annoying piece, people were still talking about us, which again, marketing mm. Holy Grail, people even bothering yeah. to talk about your brand. So what then happened was we lent into that insight and we can we can talk about Snoop, but the, the opening line of the 60 with Snoop, it's Snoop in his den uh, with his mates basically watching our commercial and saying, I'm sick of this. Get those Just Eat Fools on the line. I'm going to do this doggy style. And I actually said to the creators, I'm really uncomfortable with that line. I've got to go back to the chief exec. You know, this is, you're basically making us out like we're idiots because he's calling us Just Eat Fools. Um, so tonally, I was nervous, but actually tonally, it was spot on with the, yeah, with the so Just Eat brand. Though, yeah, it's very authentic though, because you're sort of, you're kind of putting a mirror up to yourself. And yeah. It's, it's a telling joke, isn't it? That you that you know. Yeah, we know people, this you, is a bit annoying. We know, we know it's annoying, yeah, but yeah, run with us. You know? Yeah, but I think with that is kind of the the knowing, human, playful mm. are all verbs that we use in yes. our tone of voice. So we felt we had the credibility to kind of go with that, which we did. Now, I, I'm going to show you a video now, which I think makes this point amazingly. So um, ITV did some work with Thinkbox where okay. they actually did a Gogglebox style experiment looking at what do people do during an ad break. So the, the idea was... During an ad break, you know, do people watch? Do they listen? Are they even in the room? Are they talking? You know, so actually how much of the ads get consumed? And the fascinating thing after I saw this bit of research is if I made an ad today, I would obsess about the sound, obsess yeah. about it. Because what they found is the majority of people are not watching. Sure. They're almost all listening. Yeah. But for you, it gets even better. So I'm going to play you something now and uh, let's talk about it because I think it makes the point brilliantly well. Did somebody take your So what I thought was fascinating about the clip we just had there yeah. is the fact that no one is in in this case. You know, people aren't watching the ads, but they can they just hear, and the slightest little hint of the ad just triggers people to suddenly sing the song. Uh, yeah. Not very well, by the way. I mean, I, I think my rendition actually stands up quite all right compared yeah, to some I think, of those. I but. think I take it back, John. You did well. But yeah, I think, <laughs> look, you're fighting for attention all the time and people are on their phones or they're distracted. And so, yeah, the power of audio, the power of the sonic, you know, logo, mnemonic, whatever you want to call it, um, and ours being, you know, did somebody say, clearly has had an impact. So, so yeah, I think that you're right. It's kind of how do you get people even bothering to talk about you as a brand how do you break through all of that other noise that's going on it's really difficult but but yeah i mean i think that some of the some of the work that we've done in terms of our distinctive assets um has been fantastic in terms of you know the performance of that line or that that sound that important sound in terms of like 73% of our uk population can associate did somebody say with the brand just eat that's amazing and i think you know the brand being front and center is so important because you know did somebody say you know oh you know cheeky curry or you know or an italian or whatever the answer is always jet just eat takeaway yeah. or whatever we're called in various different markets but it's kind of a call to action, implied call to action, did somebody say, with the answer being us. So, yeah, brand front and centre, really simple, dead now, simple. Now, you said in various markets, right? I'm fascinated that that, that construct of did somebody say, yeah. does that travel across into different markets? Does it work? Does it work in French, German, Spanish? Well, we think it does. And so, yeah, we spent an inordinate amount of time transcreating those simple three words to enable us to have that as our brand platform across the globe. We're in 20 markets. And again, you know, when you're trying to, uh, you know, create content that can travel, it's important that you're not reinventing the wheel every time. So, yeah, in German, in Slovakian, in Italian, and, you know, we've just launched the platform in, in America. So, you know, it really has now kind of transcended all, all of that. So, our brand as well is all around de delivering moments of joy. Uh, and I think that when you even say, did somebody say, it puts a wry smile on your face. So whether yeah. it be the doorbell moment or the minute you decide to place your order, we hope that, you know, people are always thinking about us. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Now, you're in an incredibly competitive market, aren't you? And, and, and uh, I mean, you know, whether it's Uber or Deliveroo, you know, the, the, the intense competition, the funding that's gone in, the, you know, the, the battle to get delivery drivers and all that kind of thing. Sure. So what's the secret to standing out? Because, I mean, obviously the jingle is part of it, but what other things do you have to do to make sure that you're the one that's going to be at the front of the queue? Yeah, you're right. In a world where things are, are kind of ending up being commoditized, you know, it has to be the brand 
brand, John, has to be the brand and whether people are connecting with that brand over and above rational, functional, you know, you know, free this, free that. Uh, and it's fiercely competitive in that space. It's kind of how do you get people to emotionally connect with your brand? Because ultimately, top of mind awareness and then driving that into brand preference is critical for us. And, and, and we do it in a way because, you know, the work that we're creating we want people to talk about us. And, and I think that we our story so far has been quite successful. I think there's always room for improvement. But I think that what we've done is that we've created content that people are sharing. Again, a marketer's dream. People are searching for marketer's dream. Um, and I think that we've done that through the use of talent and just being consistent with what we're trying to communicate. You know, we're trying to, and we use talent for a reason, right? So fame is just that element just elevates everything but you need to do it in a way that is authentic you've got to do it in a way that that superstar that icon can deliver your commercial messaging whether that be you can get breakfast dinner or lunch or you can go bananas at the grocery store you know all kind of honing into what we're trying to talk about as a brand and the messaging that we're trying to communicate about range about supply about quality all of those things has to be done in a credible way so that's always the challenge. Yeah, I want to ask you about yeah. how you use talent. I mean, we've got a few customers, system one, like Warburton's or Yorkshire Tea, that, that brilliantly use celebrities in a yeah. really authentic way to kind of tell their story. But I, I always question, like, how do you justify that from an investment? Because, I mean, I'm assuming none of the talent kind of did it for free out of the goodness of their hearts. But how do you build the case to use the talent and what impact does it have on the performance of the campaign? Well, look, I think it builds, doesn't it? So I, as I said, I, we started without any talent. And then it was, how do we, again, elevate it and uh, risk and reward. We approached Snoop. Um, Snoop is one of those individuals that, um, apart from being very commercially savvy, uh, he transcends generation. Yeah. He transcends cultures. And so he, and we tested him, obviously, in terms of recognizability, likability, all of the, the data points. Then you then go back to the board and say, what do you reckon? And they were like, love it. And then you have to, you have to get the song. You have to get the song. So the power of the power of the lyrics in the song, are they delivering that message? So you get the song and then you relinquish control because the song goes to the to the to the icon, to the to the musician. Um, and that's their, you know, pièce de la résistance, isn't it? it? It's what they do brilliantly. Uh, and that's a bit nerve-wracking. But yeah, how do you sell it into the board? Um, I think. People will have read uh, how much we paid for Snoop. It's not true. Uh, but we just let we let the press say what they want to say. Uh, <laughs> no comment. But you then build on it. And then so so Snoop worked brilliantly for us. Um, and we launched Snoop during COVID, which was particularly challenging at a time of our merger. So there was a moment in time where I didn't think Snoop was ever going to be seen by That's anyone. Hard, so how did you get them how did you get the money signed off when there's uncertainty about, you know, ownership and that sort of thing? Well, I think that again, you know, it was business as, as business as usual. Uh, we have targets that we need to hit, and the, and the city's looking at us. Whether we are being bought, merged, taken over, whatever, business has to go on. So you need to still be doing and performing at your very best. And I think that you know the the marketing budget approval was months before that, as you can imagine. And I think we were the last shoot in LA in the March, and then everything went dark. So we're sat on this amazing content and Suzo, we're merging and we're merging with a, with a company that's got its own look and feel. It's got its own style of marketing, which it was kind of incongruent with where we were and kind of what we felt was kind of playbook stuff. But fortuitously, we got the work away uh, and it was seen and people started talking about us. So yeah. again, that that helps when you then go back to the board to say- it Makes the next one easier, doesn't it? For sure. Yeah. So you, you kind of build on your own credibility as well as like, did that work? That was a risk. It worked great. Do we go again? Yeah. Hey, crack on. Um, which we did. And, and, and again- And what do you do to top Snoop? I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I know from a system one point of view, Snoop is universally popular, funny, great actor, the whole thing, you know. It's hard to find talent that ticks so many boxes. Who, who, do, you, who do you use next? Well, that that's the challenge. My kids said to me, mum, I think you've gone too early. Like, how do you top Snoop? You know, the use of music, as I said, you know, is a kind of universal connector, which works well in lots of different languages. You know, even though he's singing in English, people get it. They get the tune. They get the kind of the takeout. 
Snoop delivered the messages that we wanted him to deliver brilliantly. But you do go, where do you go next? And again, look, this all comes back to the brief. What is the job that we're trying to do? So, you know, Snoop put us out there in terms of, you know, cuisine types and what have you. When we ended up working with Katie, it was very much about get what you want when you want it. So it was about knowing that actually food delivery isn't about Friday, Saturday night. It's every day, three, four, five times a day if you fancied it. Um, And it was making sure that we were communicating the fact that you can get what you want when you want it. And so it was a very, the brief was different. There was obviously the, the consistency of what we were trying to do, John. But yeah, we went out and said, where do we go from Snoop? And you can imagine lots of people, oh, what about this person? What about that person? It's like, well, what is the job that we're trying to do? Um, And Katy Perry came out tops when we kind of, again, did the research. Is she recognized in Germany? Is she recognized in in Poland and, you know, in all of the markets that we operate in, in Canada, et cetera? Uh, and she was a dream to work with. She was an absolute perfectionist and w- but was very close to all things lyrics. So we had a demo. We loved the demo. She wanted to change things. Again, you have to relinquish that control to the artist. Uh, we did. But again, there was a credibility piece for her, which we think, yeah, she delivered brilliantly for it's us. It's a good point. We forget that, don't we? That, that actually for the artist as well, they're putting their reputation at stake sure. in you. So they you know, equally, they've got a brand to build themselves. So it needs to kind of work both ways. Doesn't it? And I think sometimes people might forget that. It's kind of, you know, we're, we've got the, the checkbook, but actually the reason mm. why they're so famous is because they built that themselves, their own brand. So as you said, it's the marriage of those two brands together and making sure that credibly Katie's delivering our messages that we want to talk about. So, yeah. Now you talked originally about the pitch being won by McCann and they yeah. come up with the idea at the beginning. I love that because it's it, it's magical in those moments where you just go, that's exactly it. You cracked it. Unusual actually, but because most often I find pitches are more about the chemistry and have you got yeah. the capability and that's but it's lovely to see an idea come through like that what's the secret to having an effective relationship with your agency and getting consistent because one of the things i admire about what you do is although the execution change the consistency of the idea and the quality of execution is always on point what's the secret to getting that working the relationship with McCann is one of partnerships. So they understand our business. They spend time in our business. They understand the commercial challenges that we have and what we're trying to do in terms of profitable growth. Um, and so, so yeah, it's about, they're an extension of the team, basically. And so h- how that comes about is through lots of challenge, lots of support, heated debates, Um Along the way, whether it be on the account management, client servicing side, you know, up to the MD, all of the creatives, just kind of working things through together and having that healthy tension, I suppose, Mm. healthy tension. But yeah, it's a great partnership. Yeah, yeah, very demonstrably so as well. Um, And how do you, in terms of like uh, what you do next, how do you come up with new ideas? I mean, how does that process work and how do you make the right decisions along the way? Is there any kind of approach you've got to testing the idea is good and it's going to work? Well, I don't know if anyone can see my my grey hair. Um, I mean, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? So so, uh, as you may be aware, we are in the process of rolling out the new work, the new campaign, you know, across many channels, many countries, many languages. And this time we, we kind of like, you know, let's go, let's make it difficult for ourselves. We'll go with two famous artists. So Again, what is the brief? What is the job that we're trying to do? And the creative idea was all around, you know, making sure that people understood the range of cuisines that we've got, the quality of the cuisines we've got. And you're going to be really surprised at what you find on the Just Eat Takeaway platform. And that element of surprise and delight came about by utilising two, you know, amazing artists in Christina and and Lato, very different mm. And kind of that juxtaposition almost. They of putting, work very well together there, don't they? Yeah, it's yeah. Well, I could tell you a few, yeah. a few stories, but yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, on the whole, on the you've got, whole. You've got the right take in the but, end. But I mean, look, you can see straight through yeah. the strategy there. You know, yeah. we're trying to target, you know, the younger generation, yeah. you know, the Gen Z. And the, the story I'll share with you there is that when I presented this to the wider community at, at Just Eat Takeaway at one of our senior leadership meetings, I said, anybody... Does anybody put your hand up if, if you know this artist, Lato? Not one person in the room. No, I didn't either. But no. I knew Christina. That's really, uh, yes, that's very but interesting. And then I so say, you, Christine, you everyone goes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But that's the point. You're not the target audience, mm. right? So, and a lot of nervousness from our country managers, like, I don't know who this person is, Suzo. You know, you sure? And again, we'd done our research. Yeah. You know, we'd spoken to 
customers, we'd spoken to consumers, but a very different cohort, a very mm. different group of customers that we we would love to have utilizing our service, whether it be for the, you know, the, the pizza or the or the grocery yeah. item. But we want those to be on our platform. And so you need to talk to them in a credible way because they're cynics about advertising, let's face it. Uh, and then you use somebody like megastar hip hop artist of the year, Lato, you know, 24 years old. Of course, most of the people in our office are not going to know her, but those that do are like, oh, Susan, she's so cool. Yeah. And then legend, iconic Christina together yeah. talking about our story, sharing messages around, you know, going bananas at the grocery store because that's a new ver vertical that we're in. And that's the type of stuff that you can get on the Just Eat platform. Uh, or the Just Eat Takeaway platform, again, because we were across 20 markets, you know, really credible because you go, we can target that kind of group of customers there, that group of customers there, you know, and we target a different group of customers with our UEFA sponsorship over here. So it's kind of like we are a brand for everyone and you have to find clever ways to be able to talk to them in a relevant way. One of the things you touched on, which just triggered a thought in my mind, was that the fact that you're not the customer. You need to go and get feedback from the customer. Um, I don't know if you saw it. The Amazon Christmas ad yeah. uh, got campaign turkey of the week. Yeah. And uh, we tested it on System 1, and it scored the highest possible uh, rating. And it just goes to show that sometimes, like, you know, we can be so insular, and, you know, but if you don't talk to the customer, you can make, I mean, it's incredible that, you know, Campaign Magazine, with all their, you know, expertise on the industry, can give something a turkey and it can absolutely top the polls when it comes to the audience. And, and that's also when you, that, that kind of real importance of kind of, <laughs> Sometimes going with with your gut, but also going with the data. It's the magic and the logic piece, Tons. right? So you kind of go, oh, but the data is telling me this. It's like, oh, well, I've got a feeling it, you know, that might not be quite right. Or you you listen to a group of people and and they go, don't know who that is, or yeah. I really like it. And that's that's the trick, right? It's an art and science combo. Well, I I because I, I thought a lot about this. I've, I I I've, I've tried to resolve it in this way that the gut is where the inspiration, the ideas, and the creativity okay. happens. But the, the data and science is for the decision making to check if it's right. Because like, if you just go on the science, you'd end up with like almost crazy average. You, you create category normal, but it's your instincts and your experience and your creativity that's going to come up with the idea that will end up scoring better. Yeah. In I, the end. So I think it's more about inputs and then measuring outputs. Is the, you know, some people just go on the science, don't they? And others just go on gut feel. But you kind of need to use one for creation and one for measurement. Yeah, I, I agree with that, actually. Uh, and I think that I talk a lot um, with my insights team. They're there to guide, not dictate. Uh, and sometimes you do get data results that you makes you nervous. It's like, oh, it's not going to quite, quite do what we need it to do. But then again, you you need sometimes you need to be brave and, and kind of go with it. You know, so, but again, when you talk about target audience, clearly the people at campaign are not the people that are saying this is an amazing exactly. ad. Exactly, that's We're the not one the with the, the three yeah. women on the on the sledges. No, that's that, that one. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolute freaking genius. That yeah. I mean, that is just I'd amazing. I have to say, I smiled at that one. It was brilliant, and yeah. and you know, you got the kids. You reveal them as the kids at the end, and that kind of thing is a clever twist. It's it's cross generational. It's it's a it's an experience it's we all remember. It's relatable. It's fun. Yeah. You know, Christmassy. You can imagine, yeah, it makes you feel good, right? It does. It makes does you feel exactly good. And I think what it was meant to do. We, we talk about, again, you know, delivering those moments of joy. And I think we're not talking about people guffawing with laughter. It's just, does it make yeah. you kind of a little bit of a smile, make you yeah. feel feel good? Well, really, um, what you're trying to do is, is make people feel good and then be remembered for it. And yeah. this is what sometimes people, that's what Amazon did, Gene. It's what you do, and Amazon do so well, is in making people feel good, it's unforgettably you. Yeah. Isn't it? So like you make it feel good and you just cannot get the, 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 you know, the jingle out of your head or the bright orange delivery, you know, delivery outfit. It's just impossible to forget, isn't it? Yeah. And I think you, you asked me a question earlier, John, I'm not sure I answered it about, you know, what comes next and where do you get your inspiration from? Um, and, and in fact, one of one of the markets said to me, well, Susan, what's coming next? And I said, and I actually said to her, I said, you haven't even launched it in Switzerland yet. Give me a break. Oh, you know, I so know, it's like they I want know. to know what's coming next. But in a way, I take that as a super positive yeah. because it's they're curious. They want to know how we're going to improve. What are we going to do mm. differently? And it's the one question I get asked by the exec. Who's coming next? Yes. So there's that anticipation. You can play so on that, can't you? you? You're yeah. creating it. And so in a way you're creating internal theatre because they're brand champions as well, kind of promoting all yeah. things Just Eat Takeaway. So, so yeah, that bit's really important. And if I knew the answer to that, I wouldn't reveal it on this podcast. <laughs>
<laughs> there you go. Keep manging. Um, question I wanted to round up with is, is you know, incredibly successful business. You've expanded globally. It's been like, must feel like a rocket ship of like every, you know, the growth has been incredible. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give a marketer in that kind of rapid scale up phase? Because if you compare it to say when you're running a mature brand, you know, cause it's a very different game, isn't it? It can feel different. And sometimes you have to act in a different way. What, what are your yeah, tips for I, I being think, a challenger? Yeah. And I, I think the, you know, you've got, a, that's the mindset, right? So we are a big business. We've got 16,000 employees uh, that excludes our current Areas. We're 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 delivering nearly two and a half million orders a day across our markets. Nearly two and a half million. When you say it like that, it's like that's a lot, yeah. right? And so, how can you be a challenger with that type of volume? But you know, we've got ambitions to grow, and so I think that even when I take myself back to my days at Sky, where I, that's where I learned the ropes. Um, very different environment. But again, that kind of challenger mentality, it's about putting your hand up and going, we can do this and having that license to go for it. And I suppose in a way, asking for forgiveness. Mm. So it's just, it's a mindset. It's about a winning mindset. It's about moving at pace. It's about getting 80% right. It's about mixing data. It's about, you know, data, insight, all of that stuff, as well as what do we think we should do to kind of leapfrog that next bit of growth? Yeah. So, yeah. I brief, I, I spent a short time working at Suntory and the, the founders have this lovely Japanese phrase called Yata Minahare. And it basically means it, it, it's, it's a bit like just go for it, but it's a bit more as a founder, act like a founder would and just do, right. just do what you think is right. And it was lo- a lovely expression, but that, that you know, treating it like, like you would have found as a founder yourself, I think is a I I love that mentality. Advice. I suppose the challenge comes though doesn't it for everyone is that when you grow and you have lots of people by default you need process right and it's about making sure that process doesn't get in the way of getting to do great work yeah and i talk a lot about delivering and creating leading whatever the word is great work that delivers great results that everyone's proud of Mm -hmm. i think that's kind of my kind of motto if you like um because the everyone being proud of it it doesn't matter who the mother or father is of the idea if people are talking about the work that you are doing it is the holy grail yeah. whether they're internal or external so that that's where i land on Amazing. that one well look, thank you that's a lovely place to end and very inspiring and uh, yeah thank you for opening up and sharing some of the experience on the wonderful journey that's been just eight ah oh, thanks so much john yeah did somebody say just did eat. somebody say <laughs> we had to end there didn't yeah, we? yeah thanks <laughs> thank you Thank you very much for listening or watching Uncensored CMO. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please do hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching, hit subscribe there as well. I'd also love to get a review. Reviews make a big difference on other people discovering the show. So please do leave a review wherever you get your podcast. If you want to contact me, you can do. I'm over on X at Uncensored CMO or on LinkedIn where I'm under my own name, John Evans. Thanks for listening and watching. I'll see you next time.